tip of the hat to my friend Eric who said, don't forget to tell them today is the anniversary of the Battle of Hastings. Anyone know what the significance of the Battle of Hastings was? 1066, ladies and gentlemen, it's when the French invaded England. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, a number of you uh, uh, have ancestors who ran away from England once in a while. My wife is related to Tristram Coffin, who later settled on Nantucket Island. He was the first mate on the Mayflower. So there are people who leave because others come. I hope that you have not come here because you are fleeing some other situation. However, I think we all come to church because we are coming to be away from that which pulls us down all week long. We come together to encourage each other because the battle has been happening. It's been raging around. I, I texted a friend of mine, 80, 80 year old. He was the man who called me into ministry the first time, Ron Wisby. He lives up in Napa. He had about seven minutes to get out of his house. They grabbed some pictures off the wall and they lost everything else. Fortunate. My wife told me this morning of another gentleman who was following the rest of his family out when trees fell in the way and blocked their exit. He and his wife went back, jumped in the pool. He held on. His hand got burned as it held as they kept their noses above the water while propane tanks exploded. His wife later passed away of smoke inhalation. He asked permission from her to use her shoes to walk out from the fire. That's not, that's not Dominican Republic, that's not, that's not Costa Rica, that, 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 that's not the middle of Africa, ladies and gentlemen, it's America. And it's California. And these are our friends and these are our neighbors. The battle is raging, my friends, and it is happening in so many different ways that it is causing our heads to spin. I mean, raise your hand if you heard any news about Texas this week. I didn't. Did you even hear anything about Puerto Rico? Okay, some of you. The pace at which these things are happening should be alarming. The Bible says that in the end times, men shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. That's how you know it's the end times. Okay, so my technical friends can tell me just how fast messages get around the world if you send them by text. They go up to a satellite, they come back down to the earth. Yeah, I, I, I texted somebody on the other side of the world this week. And I did last week too, welcome home. I got a text from Spain last week. And I texted back and boom, there was the answer. Knowledge shall increase, men shall run to and fro. We we are going to and fro. We are learning so much. The question is simply, are we remembering God? In all of this, do we come to the understanding of that this is, this is happening because the Bible is very clear. These are the birth pains. Now, gentlemen, we have no idea what that means. I didn't even get one amen from the ladies. I just can't imagine why that is. Okay, we have no idea what it is to be in childbirth. They have come up with these prosthetic tummies that men can wear. Uh, a, a husband who, who wants to feel the weight of a child in utero can buy one of these prosthetics and can look pregnant. 
But we do not have the ability to feel the, the, those cramps that are the body saying it's time to be delivered of this child. I remember that time very, very clearly because of how quickly Chris sat up in bed and said, oh my goodness, my water just broke. But it wasn't until hours and hours and hours later that Michaela was born. In between, we did take advantage of some drugs that they have on the market. Uh, yes, indeed. In fact, two kinds of drugs. One was to speed things along and the other was to keep it from being painful. We have that capability today. But these birth pains that I am referring to here are a world that is going through the convulsions of saying, we need to be delivered. We need salvation. Well, I have good news for you. I have good news. And it starts with those three first words in, in, in John chapter 1. And why this is important to me, or shall I say significant and, and brings back good memories, is the fact that this was where my Greek teacher started. And I do know that when somebody speaks with you, oftentimes it's what they say first that you remember the most. Sometimes it's what they say last. So I hope you remember this first because it is about firsts. In the beginning. And it's two Greek words actually. En arche. I love the ch part of Greek. That's so much fun. In the beginning, God. The fact is that the inference of that word in Greek is anything you can think of. Historian Eric, anything that you can think of. God was before that. Keep thinking back. I don't know how many billions of years you want to go... God was before that. So already in the book of John, we are given a, a, a warning, as it were, whatever you can think of, God was before that and he knew about it. So that's the first, that's, that's number one. And I, I have nine, nine things. Are you ready? I'm not going to give them to you slowly. So just know that they are in order and they come from the fact that today we're talking about the guardian of the galaxies. Some of you know that I'm punning off the name of a, a couple of films that come from comic books. And I'm saying, why, why are these films that are mega films now, why are they so important to our culture right now? Because they're, 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 all, they're all over the place. I mean, Captain America and Spider-Man and all these things that come from DC Comics. Why are they cool again? I'm going to tell you, it's not just the graphics, it's not just the CGI. It's because with all these other things happening in the world today, people are saying there's disaster on every side. There are the, we say, the birth pains. We need a Savior. We need salvation. I know that's funny to think that media such as movies could actually be teaching us theology, but the fact is, I believe that there is a yearning in the, in the whole world, because of course this media goes around the world, and people are caught up in it. I think it is mirroring a desire that people have to have a savior. We call it a savior. We could easily just call it a hero. We need a hero. Well, God says through his friend and through his disciple, John, in the beginning, God created and then came himself. That whole passage in John is 
is, is really what is in, emblazoned in my mind. So if you want a meditation this afternoon, please read first John chapter 1, not First John, but John chapter 1, verse 1. Read it several times. Because each phrase is referring to how God has come into being in our lives and what his plan is. So point number one is anything you can think of in the beginning, God was before that. Point number two, he planned, he planned for this situation before he made the world. It's tough to think of a God who knows about this kind of thing and we could say, let it happen. But he has planned for every eventuality because number three is that there was a rebellion. There was an angel. As I told the kids in Sabbath school today, there was an evil angel. And he became evil because he decided he did no longer want to follow this God that was from the beginning, that was before he, that evil angel, was created. So it is it's funny to think that a creature, yes, that had a beginning, would question a God that didn't have a beginning that he the angel could understand. This is why we think of God as the Alpha and the Omega, is because John is saying, if you think Alpha is here, just understand God is before that. So point number one, there's a beginning. Point number two, there's a plan. Point number three, there was a rebellion that took place against this God, this guardian of the galaxies. not satisfied with being removed from heaven, this evil angel decided to travel around the universe. And if you take seriously at all, the, 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 the lady Ellen, um, Ellen tells us that coming to earth was not Satan's first move. There were other stops on his tour of the galaxies. The difference is it was Adam who chose Eve over God. Now do you see why it's so important that each of us families find a Jesus boy or a Jesus girl for our children to marry? Because the first guy that was ever made chose his wife over God. It's very, very important. Folks, we need to be thinking about that. Had a discussion with at least one parent this week about that. I don't think we should take it so casually. And those of you who are looking for spouses, just understand the choice you make may determine your eternity. Because Adam, the very first human, chose his wife over God. Very, very powerful emotions. Very, very powerful thing. Now, I'm not letting Eve off. She made her own decision. She was tempted by the devil himself in the, in the form of the snake, and she made her own decision to choose herself over God. And then she goes and brings, she brings the apples that she is now eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which they had been told not to eat from, and she brings them to Adam, and Adam knows what they are and knows the choice that she has made, does not know what the trajectory is for her. He does not know, but what he does at that moment, my friends, is he chooses not to trust God. This, this moment is, is, is instructive for us. Because these moments come to each one of us. And I'm, I'm going to hazard a guess that you may have had one of these moments this week. Because I know that I have them every week. The moment is, are you going to trust God? Do you feel that God is big enough to take care of your problems? Now, before you just say, oh yeah, I think so, which I want to say, 
understand that there are choices that we make on a daily basis that say, no, I don't think that God is big enough. And if you just take a moment to think, you probably can come up with one. Each of us probably could. So before I say bad things about Eve, before I say bad things about Adam, I have to say, because of what they did, we are here. And we are still under the influence in this world that we call the valley of the shadow of death. We're still under the influence of one who is still tempting us to not trust God. To believe that God isn't capable of taking care of our situation. So I have, a, I, I, I have a, a question that I ask myself and that I'm asking you and I, I ask everybody. How big, how big is your God? You say you know God. You say you know the God of the Bible. How big is he? Is he capable? You are sitting here in church. You must believe that he is worthy of your worship because that's what we do in church. We worship God. But in your daily, daily lives, six days a week, do you trust? That's, that's the key issue. That's the key issue in the rebellion. An angel decided not to trust. And the Bible says he convinced one-third of the angels who lived in the very presence of God. He, con he, he convinced them not to trust God. And now he has descended to the earth. And his job, his, his very essence is wrapped up in with the little time that he has left. You know, because that's what the Bible says. He knows his time is short. With the little time he has left, his, his whole goal is to get you and I to not trust God. That's it, right there. So number three, there was a rebellion. Number four, the plan that I call Jesus, I call him the plan, you know that, the plan incarnated, thank you Spanish-speaking people, this is God, God incarnate, carne, Flesh. It's more difficult for us English speakers, but this is the word for flesh. The enfleshment took place. God, in this miraculous, mysterious way, came from Mary as a human being, fully 100% human, fully 100% God. We decided that as Christians in the year 300. So if you might want to push him over to being just human, watch out, that heresy has already come about in the church. If you want to push him over to being, nah, he was really God, he wasn't so human, then that heresy has also come too. And we, we try, we try very hard to stay right in the middle and believe he's 100% he's, he's God, he's 100% man. He is the plan that God had made before the foundation of the world, the Bible says. And he came in flesh as a human being. And he wasn't on the cover of GQ magazine either. The Bible likens him to a root. Now that's been made pretty popular in the movie Guardian of the Galaxy with another little character called Groot. But Jesus, Jesus is not a handsome guy. He's just a common person. Yet he comes and he, he is to be the very, the very demonstration of the character of God. Number five. We killed him. We killed him. This was prefigured as well, and the whole sanctuary service that the Seventh-day Adventist Church teaches that actually, be it known to you, many other people also study. Came across some of those individuals when I was in Canada. Was very surprised to know we aren't the only ones who build life-size sanctuaries from the desert. Yes, 
met a lady who, who uh, would, would come to church. She would come to church in clothes that she had made for herself that were in the colors of the priestly robes, white and blue and purple. Don't think we are the only ones who know stuff. We're not. The crucifixion comes as number five in my list because it's part of this journey that we're taking this morning to see about this guardian of the galaxy. It, it, it comes at a time when, uh, remember, uh, Jesus said that he would give up his life. Okay, so please understand. I'm, gonna t I'm saying it again just so that you'll get it again. Jesus was not killed by the Jews. He was not killed by the Romans. When the Romans came to see if he was dead on the cross, what did they find? He was already dead. This was unusual. Yes, that Roman had a mallet in his hands and was about to break his legs. The Bible says not one bone in his body would be broken. And to, to fulfill that on the cross, Jesus gave up. He voluntarily gave up his life for ours. And then he said, and this is the next piece, there, uh, I will take up my life. So he gave it up and he took it up of his own power. This is the God we're talking about here. This is the God who came to save. This is the God who we know as Jesus Christ. Number six, after he was resurrected, he met a, a lady that was one of his good friends and disciples known as Mary. Mary didn't know who he was. She thought he was the gardener. And she asked, where have you taken my Lord? When she found out that it was Jesus, her friend, the one who had forgiven her seven times after she had been possessed seven times by the devil, she goes to touch him, to hug him, and he tells her what? Don't touch me yet, because I have not yet ascended to my father. Jesus ascends to his father. He is validated. We don't often think about this word, but when we call somebody an invalid, we are using the same word. Validation means you're good. Stamp of approval. Jesus gets the validation from his father and then he comes back down and he meets with his disciples for 40 days. After he meets with them for 40 days, what happens? Going to go now, but I'm going to send you my Holy Spirit. What I want you to do is I want you to go to Jerusalem and I want you to wait for 10 days. Days. I want you to wait there until the Spirit comes to you. Here's an interesting piece that is added to my knowledge this week and will be added to yours now. Jesus is in heaven. There is the next piece, which is an inauguration. Jesus is coming into heaven. He is now validated. He is now coming, and He is coming with the wave sheaf. I know that's a funny word because we don't harvest things in sheaves anymore but we're talking about that old look that that comes at thanksgiving time now right when you have a a bit of grain that's been wrapped with some other grain and and it, it kind of you know in the pictures you see it in the pictures and then you see corn done the same way they wrap it and they stack it and people decorate with this stuff still but we don't understand it because we don't go around holding wheat like this and cutting it with a sickle we send in the combine harvesters and all we see is a, a cloud of chaff going up in the air but in the old times they harvested like that and when the harvest came in, it was commanded by God that you should bring one sheaf as a representation and that you should place it before the Lord as an offering, as a thank you, as a way of saying, we know that all of this 
is from you. And so we're bringing this to you as a way of saying, we know where this comes from. You are the creator God. We love you. We, we thank you. And so too, uh, when Jesus is resurrected, the Bible tells us in Matthew that there are a bunch of people who other people knew. These are, I'm going to guess, famous people who were also resurrected at the same time that Jesus was resurrected. And when he takes off 40 days later for heaven, he takes these individuals with him. They are the real. There's always the type and then the real. Israel had celebrated the wave sheaf for years and years and generations and generations. This was the real group. Here's a group of people from all ages that Jesus takes with him and presents to the Father saying, this is a down payment of the harvest that you are going to receive. My personal belief, and it's based on this very thing, the 24 elders that surround Jesus in the, in, in, in the throne room of heaven, I think they're human. Okay? And they may, be, may even be part of, of this group that came with Jesus as a down payment, as a validation, as a way of saying this is going to be the beginning of the harvest that will come. The Bible tells, Ellen tells, that at the moment, Revelation chapter 5, were you not studying this? See where I got it from? Okay. There's a class that is studying this, yes. And as this huge celebration is happening, the Spirit of God comes out of heaven and is poured out upon His people at Pentecost. So this huge celebration of the wave sheaf that is happening in heaven, these people are being presented to God as a down payment on what will happen. That celebration spills out of heaven down onto the waiting disciples. 50 days after Jesus is resurrected. We call it Pentecost. And we are encouraged and we should be encouraging one another to be praying for that same kind of outpouring upon us. We want the Holy Spirit to take possession. I had about 10 minutes to speak to the people, the kids at uh, uh, Glendale Adventist Academy yesterday. I decided I, I didn't have much time, so I had to get to the main point. And I reminded them that yesterday was Friday the 13th. And that they had a choice. Just as we all have a choice. Who is going to possess you? I'm not afraid of that word. Because the choice is there, my friends. You're either possessed by the Holy Spirit or you are possessed by the evil spirit. You do not have any place to be in between. The choice is yours. Jesus, Jesus took possession visually and audibly with the people in that moment at Pentecost. And as a result, there were 3,000 other people who said, Oh my goodness, I want some of that. And what shall we do? And Peter says, What? Repent. Turn around from the direction you're going and come back to this God, this big God, this guardian of the galaxies. Accept him, trust him, and be baptized, signifying that you're going to leave behind this old, untrusting life of yours and that you are now going to be known as somebody who trusts God. Is, is, isn't, that, isn't that what baptism is all about? You are visually showing people that this old thing is gone and this new thing is coming. Well, guess what? We, we can have that every morning. In fact, we should be praying for that every morning. Holy Spirit, take control of my life today. Be the leader of my life. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my mind be acceptable to you. Holy Spirit, take control. Well, number seven, this is where we get 
somewhat technical because you see salvation came to the planet the moment that Jesus was resurrected. But that's what we call the already. It's already done, my friends. It's already done. But you see, we're still waiting for the not yet. So I'm using a couple of theological terms here. Are they too complicated for you? I hope. They're very small words. You know, Pastor Greg and I, we like big words. But I want you to know, these are two of the most important theological words that you can grab a hold of today. The already and the not yet. We are living in between what has already happened and what we say will happen. That's why we call ourselves Adventists. Because we're living between the two Advents. And we're helping people to focus on a God who has said, I love you. A God who has said, I can't live without you, so I'm going to give my son to die for you so that I can have you back. Number seven, we need salvation, okay? We are actually looking for, you know what we're really looking for? We're looking for evacuation. The fires of hell are burning in people's lives right now. Don't even think that you can read Matthew 25 without realizing that God is asking us today to march into the hell of people's lives that, that, that they're living right now. Do you, do you agree with me that there are people in financial jail today? Does Jesus say, you visited me. You visited me when I was in prison. Yes. Yes. How many prisons can you think of that don't have bars? You clothed me when I was naked. How, how many nakednesses are there? How about social nakedness? How about spiritual nakedness? It's embarrassing to be naked, folks. When you see somebody who is suffering the, the, the embarrassment of, of not knowing, are we going to say, oh, <laughs> sucks for you. Or are we going to say, this is a person who is socially naked right now. What can I do to clothe them? The text I used for the kids yesterday was about the demoniac. We leave the demoniac in Mark chapter 5 clothed and in his right mind. That was Jesus' ministry. Come to this world where we, where, where we are poor, blind, and naked and clothe us in his righteousness and leave us in our right mind. So if you think that you're not the demoniac, if you think that your friends and, and, and relatives, people are going crazy in America today, are they not? The fires of hell are burning right now in people's lives. We need salvation. We need evacuation. What's horrible to know is that those who give the message that it's time to go don't always get listened to. So please, don't, be, don't, don't, don't just leave people. Don't just give up on people. I know that that's what God is struggling for in my life. Don't give up on those people that you are praying for. Don't give up on those people who you are working for. Please. They need evacuation. They need salvation. Just like we do. Number eight. What's promised in the future. And this comes again from the book of Revelation. We are promised a new earth, a new situation. I don't know about you, but harps on a cloud just don't get it for me. All right? So as I teach, I am certainly teaching that the greatest and most amazing thing about getting to heaven someday is that we are going to be not just entertained, but we are going to be taught of God. We're going to learn and learn, and there's never going to be a stopping to the learning that we have. And you might think, oh my goodness, I don't I want to get out of school. I don't want to be in school. No, it's going to be not boring. How's that? 
not boring. Yeah, yeah, you know, a lot of people, and in fact, on a show that I was watching, a young lady is questioned as to why she's a cutter. Okay. No, I'm not trying to kill myself, she says. I'm just bored. I am just so bored. Literally, this life is boring me to death. And, I, and she's a you know, poor little rich girl, of course, in the, in the show. And so you're thinking, how can you be bored? Well, there's a lot of poor little rich people in Los Angeles. There's a lot of poor little rich people in Santa Clarita. And they're bored. Guess what? We've got good news. Heaven is coming. There's going to be a recreation of the world. And Jesus is going to make this amazing place for us to live. And then we're going to get to travel to other galaxies because, of course, he's the guardian of the galaxies. Notice that I didn't use the real, you know, the movie. He's got them all in his hands. And it's not going to be boring getting to know them. It's going to be eternity of getting to know God and the vastness of who he is. Again, I ask you, is your God big enough? to take care of your tiny little problems? Is he big enough? I wonder. Number nine. Told you there were nine. It's going to be forever. Now, I don't know what forever means to you. Some of you are very technical people, and you can tell me what infinity looks like. I guess there's a symbol for it. But really, what does it mean to be forever? It means right now to me, when I think of Lily, when I think of other friends, it means I don't have to be afraid to die. That's what it means. That's what it means to me today. That's what eternity means to me today. I don't have to fear. Because you see, that's the main motivation of the evil empire is fear. And they use death, the threat of death, as the way to motivate us to follow. So go from here today, my friends. Please be encouraged to trust the God of life. To trust the God who has made this entire plan and has laid it out for us and has said, if you trust me, I'll take you through to your eternity. Jesus said, if I am resurrected, you will be resurrected. So, fact is, he was resurrected. Therefore, the other half of that promise is waiting to be claimed by you and me. The rest of our eternity. I, I do use, of course, the Star Wars analogy. This is just episode one of our eternity. So yes, I give you full permission. Instead of just saying, happy Sabbath, when you leave today, say, brother, sister, how's your eternity? How's it going? You see, because on the other side of whatever's coming for us, when Jesus recreates the world and he brings us all together again and we are on that other side of the great controversy that is going on right now, that will be episode two. And we'll look back on this episode and we'll realize the two are connected because of Jesus Christ. That the life that we're living right now is part of our eternity. So I'd say that's pretty good news. I'd say that, that you know, if, if, if you're struggling today with trusting God, then you did the right thing by coming to church because this pastor wants to make you for sure, for sure, that you can trust Jesus Christ, that he is big enough. He is big enough for anything that happens to you. So the question remains, are you going to trust him? Because he's the guardian of the galaxy. Amen.